Welcome to another episode of Seven Minutes Medicine. Today we're going to talk about a very common uh, medical problem in the ICU and even the general world. It is uh, the management of diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome. So first, DKA is a serious metabolic derangement characterized by acidosis, dehydration, and hyperglycemia. And HHS is almost the same, except for characterized by hyperosmolarity and not much uh, acidosis. For the management, the main important thing is the IV fluid replacement and giving the insulin. We're going to discuss those two important topics in a nutshell. First, for the IV fluid replacement. So, initial intervention, we start by giving normal serin. Uh, which is like 0.9% because it is the best fluid for resuscitation. Those patients, because of the osmotic diuresis, they have been dehydrated. So ideally, we have to give them some fluid to resuscitate them. If the, if the patient is in hypovolemic shock and the systolic blood pressure less than 90, we would like to give the IV fluid as boluses because boluses are, are more helpful for the uh, blood pressure support compared to the continuous IV fluid. If the patient has hypovolemia but without shock, we might give uh, IV fluid as an infusion. We should not exceed 50 ml per kilogram in the first 24 hours. If the patient has um, some kind of hypoglycemia, and the patient in glycemic DKA can have low, glycemic, low glucose. On the same time, also, they can have normal glucose with a DKA. We might need to add some dextrose. After the first four hours of initial resuscitation, we have to calculate the sodium. And we have to calculate the corrected sodium because the hyperglycemia can cause uh, pseudo-hyponatremia. So what we do, for every 100 in glucose, we add 1.6 to 2 to the sodium. Uh, so if the corrected sodium is less than 135, we continue to give normal serin. If it's normal or high, we flip to half normal serin because it gives you some electrolyte-free water. For the potassium replacement, we want to make sure that the patient has good urine output before starting the replacement, more than 50 ml per hour. If the potassium is less than 3.3, we should give 20 to 40 ml equivalent every hour through the IV. If the patient has potassium 3.3 to 5.3, we have to give 20 ml equivalent of potassium in every 1 liter. And if the potassium above 5.3, we should not give more potassium. We can hold on it and keep it checking. Our target is 4 to 5. For the insulin administration. So we give insulin to shut down ketogenesis, lipolysis, and gluconeogenesis. IV regular insulin is the preferred. In moderate and severe DKA. Some protocols, especially in the COVID time, they proposed a subcutaneous uh, short acting insulin instead, but it's not highly recommended in moderate or severe DKA. So we give a regular insulin bolus, uh, so 0 0.1 unit per kilogram, 10 units max, and then you go by 0 0.1 unit to 0.14 units per kilogram per hour. And you, or what you can do is you can stick to your hospital protocol. Many pro hospitals, they develop a protocols uh, to give the IV insulin uh, in case of DKA. So you may need to stick to your hospital protocol because it might be easier for the clinical staff to adjust the insulin based on the protocol. And if the glucose is 200-250 mg per deciliter, you might need to add some dextrose to the fluid. Um, 
because after uh, two, if you decrease it more than 250, especially in HHS, you may end up with cerebral edema. And we don't want this to happen. And we can drop the insulin infusion a little bit because we don't want to drop the glucose too much. But we have to keep giving the insulin and the dextrose at the same time. My carb replacement is one of the most controversial topic. But generally speaking, if the pH less than 6.9 or 6.9, you may give by carb until the pH more than 7. And for the phosphorus, if the phosphorus is less than 1, you have to give phosphorus replacement to avoid muscle weakness. When there is resolution of DKA and HHS, so in the DKA, once the anion gap is closed, and the patient can eat, and the meat hydroxybutyrate decreased, we can say there is a resolution of DKA. And for the HHS, with the plasma osmolality less than 315, and the patient is alert and able to eat. So the patient able to eat is an important thing. We should not overlook it. Transitioning to the basal bolus regimen. So the basal bolus regimen is two parts. The first, the basal, the short acting. In the DKA, after the DKA dissolved, the patient is able to eat. We overlap the short acting with IV insulin for at least two to four hours. For the HHS, we can start the short acting when the blood glucose is less than 250 milligram per deciliter. So for the link acting insulin, if the patient is non-diabetic patient, then we might give the long acting insulin at the time of the short acting or at the evening before. At the same home dose or higher if the patient insulin requirement were high during the insulin refusion or if the hemoglobin A1C showed uncontrolled diabetes. If the patient is a newly diagnosed diabetes mellitus, we use 50% of the total daily dose calculated at 0.5 to 0.8 units per kilogram. The basal insulin that can be used is glargine, NPH, Ditamer, and insulin pump. So is this some literature supports the idea of starting wrong acting insulin within 12 hours of the initiation of the intravenous insulin which may help to prevent rebound hyperglycemia after resolution of DKA. Thank you for listening to our lecture, and please, if you like our content, subscribe to our channel. Thank you.